Test, test, test. All right. Hey, settle down. Settle down. What are we doing here? Settle down. <laughs> Good evening. I'd like to welcome all of you to St. John's. Uh, many visitors here. I see quite a few visitors from our sister church, Reformation. And so if you wonder what your pastor is going to look like in 25 years, that's it. His Uncle Mark. So Pastor Paustian from Reformation, his Uncle Mark Paustian. Um, also, look around where there he is, Pastor Krieger, St. John's members. There's former vicar. This is also his uncle. So Pastor and Kate are here. So welcome. Um, we're just really privileged to have Dr. Mark Paustian with us. Um, this will be archived on our YouTube channel for you to share and to watch again. And I'm going to read this as a way of introduction um, from our Facebook. And uh, Pastor Paustian wrote this. Uh, Mark graduated from Wisconsin Seminary in 1988. From there, he was called to an ex exploration mission start in Rockford, Illinois, where he served until 2001 through the building of a gorgeous sanctuary for a New Life Church in Rockford. He's been teaching at Martin Luther College in New Orleans, Minnesota since then and currently specializes in the areas of interpersonal communication, Old Testament Hebrew, apologetics, and homiletics. Mark holds two master's degrees and a PhD in communication from Regent University. He's a frequent presenter, has written books on witnessing and on worship. Mark enjoys world travel, music, and the outdoors. Mostly, he's a family man. He's been married to Constance Nee Kroll for 33 years. Together, they have two daughters, Abby and Hannah, and two sons-in-law, Keenan Smart and Joe Rodewald. I'm holding one of Dr. Paulson's books in my hand, uh, Devotions for Christian Worship. We bought a number of these copies for new members, and there's a table of them in the entryway, so grab a copy on the way out. That's a gift from St. John's if you want a copy of uh, this awesome devotional book. So, uh, Dr. Paulson is going to go to about 725, and then we'll take about a five-minute break. Uh, you're all invited to stay for the 7.30 prayer at the close of day service, but uh, don't feel obligated to attend that. There'll be a time for you to leave after the presentation before the service. Dr. Paulson, let's give him a warm St. John's welcome. Thank you so much. Now that bio feels kind of braggy, so I apologize for that. Uh, it's just so great to be here. Beautiful drive down, day off classes, not that I want that all the time but uh, get to make some new acquaintances. I'm just so happy to be here. I do get a little bit nervous because I was presenting, like today, on something from a class at, at a teacher's conference. And a student, I actually used to like this guy, the student in, in, the, front, in the front row, I, I, I said, hey, Nate, in the middle of my presentation, hey, Nate, why don't you tell folks what people make fun of me at, for at MLC, at Martin Luther College. I won't tell you what I thought he would say or why that was relevant, but it kind of caught him off guard. What do they make fun of me for at Martin Luther College? And he, he kind of froze and he kind of said, your voice. And I'm like, no. <laughs> well, yeah, but no, but no. Come on, what do they make fun of me for? And a student over here says, how you dress? I'm like, really? <laughs> and by now my students are warming to the task. When you cry, that's what I got, when you cry. And I'm smiling, smiling like right now, but in my head I'm like, Lord, please make a stop. So that's a little insight into, into my life. Uh, this class that I'm drawing from is one that gets a little bit of buzz on our campus now and then. And so we'll maybe say later a little bit about why it's relevant. I believe I sense that after we've done this topic in that classroom, that things are different. Things are just a little bit different. Having embraced this spiritual gift, having celebrated, having, having unleashed it, having thought about it, the power of words, it just has an effect. So here we go. The question that will consume us tonight is, what is it about certain words? Uh, on the sea or ocean of all the words we say, what makes some words rise to the top and be extraordinarily influential? take to the grave, impactful, disproportionately powerful. What is it about certain words? So I guess we'll do this for this, okay? We'll look at some more scriptures. Put the whole slide up, thank you. But just for now to say, this is all across the scriptures. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death. Like apples of gold and settings of silver, 
another proverb says, so is the right word at the right time. So in a different time, it would not have been the right word, but the right word at the right time. Um, Paul cares deeply about this. Therefore, encourage each other, build each other up all the more as you see that, that the day is approaching. So, what is it about certain words? I hope you have stories too that you kind of can connect with this. The first time I ever, I ever preached at the seminary, the student critic gets up and says his piece, and the professor got up and what he said was, my, that was breezy. That was not a compliment, in case you're wondering. <laughs> not a compliment. My, that was breezy. Okay. So I sit in the next class, and my best friend passes me a note. And the question is, this is 40 years ago, why can I still see it in my mind's eye? Why can I still remember it? I see the red ink on the lined paper. Why? He said, how anybody can call what we just heard breezy is beyond me. You have a fire in your gut for the gospel. Don't change a thing. That's what it was 40 years ago, 40 years. So what is it about those words? One thing is you can search that note all day long and not find anything that was in it for him to tell it or to send it. And so there is that other-centeredness about it. Just, just one quality. So I stole a beloved teacher from a first and second grade classroom in Belle Plaine, Minnesota. I went to her farewell. If you ever, ever had first and second grade boys staring daggers at you, this little flock of boys looking at me like, that's the guy, there he is. Anyway, they, they ushered us into the gym, and there was a quilt on the wall that every child had contributed a square, and near the bottom left, a little, little square with a musical staff, and in a child's hand, it said, what God ordains is always good. Four years earlier, when this child's world was falling apart, Miss Crow opened her hymnal to this child. And four years later, she offers it up in tribute. She gotta know those words held that child together in a dark, dark place. She just gotta intuit and know. So what is it about certain words? Um, let's put some other things up. Oh, there it is. Well, actually, that, that's the slide I wanted, John. Thank you, Pastor. So you search through the Proverbs, and there's this thing about you're, you can be like a stream. Um, you can be like a tree with fruit on your branches, that people come to expect refreshing. They can come to expect sustenance from you. Uh, one proverb that takes us a whole another place, a uh, man finds joy in giving an apt reply. How good is a timely word? And with that, I ask you the equation is that there's joy on both sides. There's joy on both sides. Um, I tell my students, this is the greatest joy in life. Uh, she was a daughter of a member of my mission. Um, the daughter was Catholic. The mother was a member. The daughter was never going to have children. They told her, impossible. But then she got pregnant. And then there were complications. Bump into her in, in the grocery store. And we talked. I don't know what's going on. I, I, don't know what, I don't know what God is doing here. But I just kind of mumbled out something like, but I know his heart. God on a cross dying, I know, I know his heart. And, and you'll be okay. Something like that. Well, I don't know if she just never, never been talked to that way before. I don't know. I'm not, this is not braggy. This is a simple thing to say. Um, but the story was she would tell the family, what happened to all my fear? <laughs> what happened to all my fear? And I just, maybe need to go to that church, she said. It's just a simple thing. So I tell my students, and this is why it applies to all of us, because this isn't preaching. This isn't teaching. This isn't scripted. Uh, this is the day-to-day -day interpersonal unscripted thing. Although, I do think of it often when I write a sermon, part of, part of my mind is always on what are these people afraid of? And I'm kind of tipping my hand a little bit. What are these people afraid of? But mostly we're talking about the unscripted kind of thing. So, um, Hebrews 10 adds something to the mix, and that is, let us consider how, which is to say, it takes some thought. It does take some thought. Let's consider how to encourage. And we'll have examples of why bright, cheery words can destroy you, and words that don't sound so bright and cheery can really, really 
um, restore you. So, what's next? Put this whole slide up, please, Pastor. Thank you. Every now and then I stumble into, just as a scholar, I stumble into some research term that opens up a whole avenue of research I didn't know about. For example, recently it was change the moment. How do you change the moment? So that kind of applies, but mo mostly it's, I stumbled across the search term, oh, that's a typo, I just changed it. It's actually memorable, memorable messages. Memorable messages. So scholars look at what was it that was said to a person that made him be the first one to go to college? What was that thing that was said to him? So there's other people that are interested in this, what I'm interested in. How did we retain an at-risk student? What did somebody say that kept him in the game? Why did you want to be a doctor? Why did you want to be a farmer? What was the thing that somebody said? Or for my own students, teacher, pastor, what was, what was that? And it's just kind of heartening, kind of warm research. Rescue from despair, stay in a marriage, don't leave these kids. What did somebody say? So a very similar interest, but we can do way, way better with what we have at our disposal. Uh, a former student good, became a good friend, dreamed of being in the Air Force, but the physical revealed something that wasn't gonna go away and disqualified him, and it threw him into a pit of despair. Disproportionately was he despairing over that event. Some pastor said to him, of all the things you say, why was it this? Some pastor simply said his name was Mark. Mark, are you baptized? Mark, are you baptized? You've got to have, got to have a Lutheran soul to know why that was the thing, you know, that was the pinprick of light at the end of a dark tunnel. He would say it saved him. So, others are interested in this, this area, the power of words. We have a special interest and special things at our disposal. There it is. <laughs> if there are any, I'm trying to be subtle here. <laughs> if there, if, <laughs> oh, throw somebody under the bus, will you? <laughs> if there's any linguistic scholars here, I'll put an asterisk by this one. <clears throat> the point is, I, I want to talk about the etymology of the word in Greek. The asterisk is that we don't really think about etymology as we choose our words. We really just choose words based on how they're used. Um, but Greek does put words together in its own kind of way, builds words, and so maybe it's okay to mention the etymology. Para, come alongside the runner. Kala o call, call to him, call to her. So some people think kind of a coaching almost because there's a lot of, a lot of different things you might end up saying but to come alongside and to say something. So you can't tell now, but I was a diehard runner back in the day, but you can't tell now, <laughs> but I really, really was. I was, um, biggest race I was ever in. And, and it's half a mile to go and my chest is on fire. Cross country is a sport that's about how much can you take, really, that's kind of the whole thing. So chest is on fire, legs hurt, I don't think I can make it. Half a mile looks like forever. I got a kid beside me from university school in Milwaukee. And so what do I do? I say to him, man, I feel great. <laughs> let's, let's pick up the pace and finish together. That's what I said. So really cheery words. But he died, which is, run, run, no, sorry, running lingo. He didn't actually die. But he, he, I went fast about two strides and then he slowed down almost to a walk. At the end of the race, he said to me, don't ever talk to me in a race again. <laughs> because <laughs> what happened was what was supposed to happen. And that is that his chest is on fire. It really hurts. Legs are burning. He can't make it. The kid beside him is doing fine, just fine. And so he just destroyed him. So happy words. Um, not being exactly encouraging. Get the idea? The, the, the reason to tell the story really is to take it to the book of Acts for a second. The Apostle Paul, um, oh, one more thought. So I went to school for, the, for my PhD in a program of wonderful scholars, Christian scholars out east in Virginia. But there was a bit of a vibe there. It was kind of like, like this all the time. And woohoo, you know. <laughs> and you know the song maybe? Um, 
uh, oh, I'm happy, 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 happy all the time. Oh, yes, I'm a song for terrible song for children. Don't, don't have them sing that song, please. But that was kind of the vibe, happy, happy, happy. And I thought, if I lived under that, so happy, so cheery, I don't know if I could even stand it. Because I find it, I find it all very difficult. If that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't know. Am I? And so here's the Acts story. Apostle Paul goes on his first missionary journey, does a little kind of curl through Aconia, Lystra, Derby, and then goes backwards through those churches on his way back home. And of course, uh, Paul would not have wasted the moment, but he's going to preach and preach and preach on his way back. But all of whatever that was, the writer Luke summarizes in one sentence, captures all that preaching in one sentence. And the sentence is, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of heaven. We must go through much tribulation to enter the kingdom of heaven. And I think, why is it so hard? Because it has to be. We're going we're gonna to follow Christ and stumble along on, on, under a cross of our own and imitate our Lord in his humiliation. How it must be. First the cross, then the crown. So there's my example of the words are not cheery. They're not bright. But they are, well, Luke said, Paul encouraged the churches. They are encouraging in a profound sense. And so let's get more into where, what's going on here. Go ahead. So, could put the whole slide up, thank you. First time you get to hear a sinner talk is kind of instructive. Um, now, we're not using the story of the garden as allegory. They literally jumped into the bushes, and this is what the first sinner said. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. There's a lot that's new here, a lot that we've never had heard of before, experienced before. And what I, not to be allegorical, but to say there's a pattern here that does play out in certain ways. Um, even for us. So next slide, please. The new emotion is fear. The new strategy is no one better see me as I am. Or the new motivation is nobody better see me as I am. And so I'll hide who I really am is the whole new strategy. And so, yeah, this is not psychobabble to say that the new reality for the sinner, beginning with Adam, the new reality was to be unacceptable. Not just to feel it. To actually be unacceptable. There's way more going on in here than, you know, loving God and loving people. And if anybody saw that, you would, you would just turn away. You would just turn away if you ever saw that. So I better hide. I better hide. Um, so the social mask is just a kind of very simple communication term for the way I decide to put myself out there. The social mask has two really critical purposes. I feel like survival, when it is to get as much approval as I can, to avoid rejection as much as I can, because that feels like dying. And I, I tell students, I have this sentence where I'll always often say, we had different degrees of success at that, you and I. Some of us figured it out in a way some of us didn't. And the room gets really quiet because nobody gets a pass from this dynamic, if you really knew. Now, the answer isn't to strip people's masks away. That's not very kind. So I know why you are the way you are, and I know, I know what's going on with you, and I know what you're afraid of, and to play psychologist is not what we're looking for, Some, but something much, much wiser than that. So go ahead. That'll make more sense later. <clears throat> so it's really simple to say the essence of encouragement is words spoken to the fear that somebody hides inside. So every example I can think of, now we should probably say fear here is kind of a catch-all for all the negative stuff. It really kind of a catch-all for shame and inadequacy and isolation and just the whole range of things that people go through. And the examples I can ever think of where these words were disproportionately powerful. This is, I can't think of an example that this doesn't fit. But the words spoke to the fear somebody hides inside. There are other things surrounding the process, like I've got to be credible, I can't just say anything, you know, cheer people up or whatever. 
No, but the runner in the race can't make it. And the words I say to him just stir up that fear. He's not going to make it. And you're in, a, you're in a class and you heard your first sermon was terrible. And what are you, what are you afraid of? Of course, it's not rocket science what you're afraid of. But someone found the grace to speak to that. The little child's life is falling apart and her teacher opens her hymnal to her. What God ordains is always good. So we're not really after what will happen anyway. We're not after making people feel better. That'll probably almost always happen. But we're really after something much more profound and much, and much deeper, and that is to get back in the race. Back in the race. Don't you give up. Back in the race. So we'll, again, make that make sense as well. The words spoken to the fear. Somebody hides inside. Go ahead, let's see what's next. So consider the home run of biblical encouragement is absolutely the gospel itself. Adam and Eve are bracing themselves for the flood of rejection to come washing over them when the one they were designed to enjoy, the ultimate one, is going to reject them and again wash over them in waves. And that will be dying. And what comes instead is that first, that first uh, mysterious but yet relatable gospel to Adam and Eve. The enmity would, be, would not be between God and Adam and Eve. It would not be there. He moved it between them and the devil. The relational message is, I am still your God. I'm on your side. I'm going I'm to do something about this, is the relational message. And when they first heard that, they came alive with that. And when you first got that news, that your God is, your God is unspeakably good, and that you can trust him in everything, because he's reconciled you to himself in Christ, when you got that message from the ultimate one, you came alive. And it's what keeps you alive. Every time, you, it's the kindest thing to do for a person is to say those things and etch that message sort of in the bottom of a soul. And so gospel is the home run. I don't often quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you know about the German Lutheran pastor who was assassinated right near the closing days of World War II for trying to assassinate Hitler. Quite a story. I don't quote him much because I don't always know what he means. <laughs> He's using words that sometimes I'm not sure, but he wrote a, quite a gem of a book <laughs> called, it's called Life Together. It's about his days in an underground seminary during World War II. And the book is about why I need my brother. That's what it's really about. Why I need my sister. Fascinatingly, the book opens up in a very timely way for us and says, the physical presence of other believers is what a gift that is, a physical presence. And you thought about that all through COVID, to be in the same place with my brother and sister, just all by itself. But then here's what he writes about. He says, I look for Christ in my heart and I can't find him. It's faith is not made to look in that direction. So I look for Christ in my heart and I can't find him. Now, you and I know that we need to, I don't know, how do you say it, have self-talk that's true and affirm for ourselves the gospel and affirm for ourselves that we are children of God through faith in Jesus and we want to tell ourselves that in certain ways. But we are at the same time relational creatures. I just, it's why I need my brother and my sister to close the loop is when it comes from a brother or a sister. And so what Bonhoeffer said is, I look for Christ in my heart, I cannot find him. But I consistently find that Christ is strong in the word that comes from my brother or my sister. Christ is strong in the word that comes from my brother and sister. I look you in the eye and say, you are loved. You are loved with an everlasting love. And here's how I know God revealed his heart on the cross and paid your way. And, and so the gospel is the home run. There isn't an inexhaustible list of things to learn to talk about. It can, be, it can come out talking about identity or you're not in control of the things you care about. What, what does that do to you? Control, um, cross-bearing. Not an inexhaustible list of things that for me, just come up over and over. What I'd also say, though, is that if the gospel is the home run of biblical encouragement, there is also another 
layer that just comes from a gospel place, I would say, in kind of a culture of grace. I say to a pastor track kid at my college, I see a pastor in you. That's not the gospel. But it still can have the same force of what we're talking about, words that address the fear. That makes sense? I say to a, to a female student, if I mean it, only if I mean it. But oh my goodness, you've got more than you know. I like that about you, that you, got, <laughs> you don't even know, but you've got more than you know. And so it's, that's not the gospel either. But it comes from a place of gospel acceptance. And so I had a student in class. She was talking about something in class and she matter-of-factly said, oh, I know I'm ugly. I've always known that. And then she continues with whatever she had to say. And a little bit awkward, it just hit me kind of, kind of hard. So I pulled up a desk and a chair and sat down in front of her and tuned the rest of the people out and just talked to her for like five minutes. And, and by the way, my, my dissertation was about something called indirect communication. It's a really kind of complicated, complicated, but it's the fact that I'm not talking to anybody else that maybe leaves the defenses down for those people too. You know what I mean? I'm not asking, I'm not talking to them. I'm not asking anything of them. Like, I'm not talking to them, but, but I am in a very indirect way. And I say that now because when we get to examples, some of my favorite examples are all indirect. We'll, we'll look at that. But so I'm sitting with this girl and I just, here's why you don't get to say that. 21 years old, you don't even know who you are yet. And so we spoke about Jesus and about identity. I'm not talking to all of them, but I am. <laughs> so a student will say, well, what about someone that's just fishing for compliments? It's the same kind of thing. She just fishes for compliments. And that isn't really a useful conversation. It happens over and over and over. Well, how about one day you just say to her, you know what, I'll tell you you're beautiful and talented as many times as you want. I don't, I'll never get tired of telling you that. But then you say, but you know what, it's never going to be enough. I, never going to be enough. Here you are, 20 years old, and don't know who you are. Well, let me tell you. And so it's a wonderful thing to think through every imaginable scenario in life and how I might design words for that person. So let's, let's go further. What is the effect of words designed this way? Go again, please. It would just make sense that to some degree, the need to posture, the need to pretend, the need to hide would become, maybe lose its grip on me to some degree at least. Would that makes sense? If my fears are spoken to, and we know what we are, we know what we are here, both as sinners and as children of God. There, there's a, a, a simple verse, I just find it to be simply eloquent, this, Paul saying, let us throw off falsehood and speak truthfully to one another. And, and where does that come from? It comes from a position of strength. It comes from that my fears have been spoken to in this little community. And so it's hard for me to put words on this completely, but, but my sense is when I have a classroom, that's my context, and the classroom is, is a safe place. And here I'm loved and you know, here I'm accepted and it's just, it's just a safe place and a good place to be. That, that, that would mean that students aren't using half their minds and half their cognitive energy protecting themselves and being safe from what might happen to them in that room. I, I gotta think the, the effect on learning is, is maybe subtle but profound, the fact that this is an encouraged community. This is a culture of grace. The words are being spoken, you know? Or a congregation, a church family. I got to think it would translate into the, the humble receptivity to the word that we want when your mind isn't busy with, you know, am I, am I right, am I all right? So, let us throw off falsehood and speak truthfully to each other comes from having a generally encouraged place. Let's advance the slide. How do people let you know that they are hungry for words. First of all, um, 
You don't need to know why, but I've, I've found my adolescent life to be super hard. <laughs> I wouldn't go back for all the tea in China. I just wouldn't. It was hard. And I think, I know, that if somebody, did, I, I know that I could have told you exactly what I wanted somebody to say to me. I couldn't say it to myself. I could try, but we're relational. We need, I need my brother, I need my sister. I could have told you what that was. And I said that much in a class on this, and a girl came up to me after class, visibly shaken. And her story was, I was in seventh grade when it all fell, fell apart for me. I was in seventh grade. It all fell apart for me. And she's, she is, through tears, saying, why didn't anybody see me? Why didn't anybody say the obvious thing to me? It wasn't all my fault that my family fell apart. Why didn't anybody see that? Was it not obvious? And so isn't that kind of an interesting dynamic that I could tell you, please, somebody, say this particular thing and mean it and be credible. And so if you were to enter the social milieu and say, I got my, my radar tuned for, people are hungry for words, what would I see? Well, first of all, so, hey, Bob, how are you doing? And Bob says, ah, I'm okay. <laughs> okay, so he just put something in his voice something in his shoulder, something in his eyes that said, I'm not at all okay. And my sense is that it's like taking the mask and pulling it back a little bit, showing a little bit of a hint of it, and it's kind of wondering, you gonna catch this? <laughs> you gonna catch this? Because I'll show you more. So uh, Superman, Superman had a mask, social mask, that was called Clark Kent. And every now and then, you know, he pulls back the shirt and the big S on his chest stands for super because that's who he is. He's super, you see. Um, this is a negative example of they pull back a little bit and the S stands for... I don't, don't want to say it. The semantic noise is too awful for Not I stink, but... Or the S stands for shame. Uh, I for inadequate. Whatever. A for alone, how's that? A for alone. And we pull back and reveal who will see, who will notice, who has words. So I started to say, if I went out there and said to myself, who needs words? I just think I would see a whole sea of ministry, not public ministry, ministry, waiting to happen. Um, I think that the most together person you know, people that you know, is the person that no one thinks they need this, so they don't probably get much. But that the most together person you know, you speak words to them, and you'll find out that it was, these were the right words at the right time. But if you just tune your radar for this, our former president of the seminary, Paul Wendland, and I would talk several times about the question of, given the grace that we have, as well as, well as Lutherans, the grace that we receive, the unconditional gospel, why so inhibited? Why so inhibited? That we could have a culture of speaking freely and openly about Jesus to each other. Not in some pious way, sham. No, no, in the, in the, in the Paul's way. Conversation full of grace, seasoned with salt. Know how to answer people. Uh, so speaking freely and openly is this capability that is to be coveted and, and desired. And we'll talk away at the end about maybe the key to that. But people need words. People need words. So if I said, characterize the communication taking place and show the arrow, that would be like um, social scripts. How you doing? I'm fine. How are you? And people just kind of bumping into each other socially. And are we saying that's bad? No, not at all. Could that be encouraging? Sure, a little bit. You come into a place that you're accepted and you're dealt with warmly and people light up for you, of course. People light up for you, of course. That's encouraging on this certain level. Um, not what we're after quite yet. Next slide. So this would be to try to diagram me talking to you from my social mask. 
So me talking to you out of my need to have you think I'm awesome or something like that. Me talking to you out of my need to have you think I'm a fine pastor and all that. And so out of that, I speak words to you. And could that be encouraging? Sure. I mean, if it's the word of God, then the fact that I'm insincere, it just still isn't what I'm after, the kind of communication I really, really covet and want to nurture. So that's the next slide. So the middle circle doesn't have to be the unacceptable core. We're just saying it's genuine. It's not coming from the mask. Um, let's say in, in good old C.S. Lewis, self-forgetting, in self-forgetting, that kind of humility, I actually see you and perceive you and think what it might be like for you, the first sermon you preached that you got this, and I see you. And me not talking out of my need to have you think anything at all because I'm not thinking of myself in that moment. Not talking out of my need to have you think anything at all. I sent words in. I just sent words in and did the best I can with the wisdom I have. Don't always know what the effect is. Don't always know. But that's what we're after. Just to put a picture to it. Okay, so. What we do in class then is we have case studies. And I always say, there's not, there's not a right answer here, it's just the right question. The right question is, what is this person afraid of? Or what else is in that big catch-all list of really painful emotion and experience? So here's one example. My dad said in his retirement sermon, I know there will be days of uselessness ahead. And we just hit our hearts hard and, oh, dad, don't say that, but he did. And then many years later, has a stroke, uses a walker, depends on his wife for everything. To strip the mask away foolishly would be to say, don't laugh at this, I don't mean it to be funny or flippant. Would you say, boy, dad, I bet you really feel useless now? That would be stripping the mask away. It would just be a, an unkind and foolish thing to do. So I turn students loose on this question, what would you say? And we find that there's layers and layers and layers and layers. So this is a lecture series, so I get, to, I get to just lecture. So let me just give a couple examples. Uh, if I would call dad for advice, sincerely, it would be to say, dad, I need you. I'm gonna use you for as long as I have you. That'd be an example. Um, Students will say, well, just tell him he's going to heaven and tell him he's forgiven. And I say, amen, hallelujah, thank you for that. Because I always say to them, I hope Professor Frederick, my colleague doesn't, colleague, doesn't mind this. I say, imagine Professor Frederick. He's kind of our guru, just so smart, so wise. And so imagine Professor Frederick, he's in the hospital and he's on his deathbed and you are called, go and be by his side. And I say, what in the world would you ever tell that man? He doesn't already know. And if that's what your thought process is, I just say, that's a miscalculation. Tell him his sins are forgiven for Pete's sake. <laughs> Tell him heaven is open. Um, Sunday school truth. There's a, in, in this encouragement thing, there's what I like to call a, a simple eloquence born of love for the gospel. And the love for the gospel is born of the need of the gospel, but a simple eloquence. Um, my, my dad was a pastor when our college of pastors was in Watertown, Wisconsin. And not a month would go by, someone wouldn't say to me, yeah, a pastor would say, yeah, I'm not proud of who I was in college, but I always wanted to be your dad's turn in the pulpit because I always had grace. Now we hear that story, I just call dad up, hey dad, I heard the coolest thing. He wrote a book for aging people and I, get these stories of they had to wake up the nursing home director to get into that room and get that book and read that to her as she died. Hey, Dad, heard the coolest story. And the secret to my father was our last Christmas, no one saw this coming, but our last Christmas, a box comes from NPH Publishing House with his book, with a new cover. No one saw this coming. And the way he sat in a corner and wept. That's a clue. 
So pastors say this, pastors say that, and, and hey dad, coolest thing, and the message is, dad, you lived a significant life, and the gospel that you love dearly is living on beyond you. That's what that meant. Oh, oh, kind of, you know, cute by that bit of memory. I wrote a, a, a paper on vocation, and I put one line in the paper that was for my dad. He was my biggest fan. I knew he'd read it. I knew he would know that I wrote it for him. We would never talk about it, but this one sentence is in this paper. And the sentence simply is something like this, about the vocation of the elderly. And I just said, one of the most important things a man does in his life is shows his family how to die. How to die cheerfully and confidently for Jesus' sake. And Dad, we're watching you. This is such an important time in your life, and you're blessing us. Just in very, so all these examples, if you notice, they're all kind of indirect, asking for advice. So let's try another one or two. This one I dared to do at a, at a conference, a ladies' conference years ago, and whew, we <laughs> struck a nerve. We talked about this for, I think, 45 minutes, just this one slide. So that was a mistake on my part. <laughs> but, so I love the example because you can see what it is. This is a true story, too. Um, she struggled for three Sundays. She's there by herself and all of that. On that third Sunday, or the fourth one, let's say, um, Ruth, God bless your soul, turned and gave a look to this woman when her child was being loud. And the look was not a pleasant look. And church is over and she run walks to her car. And your instinct kicks in that if we don't go talk to her and say something, she'll never come back. It was that awful. So case study, my students, what would you say? So we said there's a lot of answers. It's the right question. What's she afraid of? What is she afraid of? Again, um, not rocket science. Bad mom, for one. And, and by the way, how significant is that? Bad mom. Um, they don't want me here. I ruined everything for everybody. And this whole range of fears that she's going through. That, and when we say something to her, it's going to make her feel better, maybe, but that's not the agenda. It's, we want to keep her going because this is so hard. And why am I by myself? She are all wondering, why am I, what did I do? What did I, what did I do that I'm by myself? How did I mess up? These are her fears. Now, all you really know about her is that she's doing this heroic thing. That's all you really know. She never gets a break, ever, 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 ever does she get a break. And she does this on a Sunday morning. My goodness, you hero, you, you know. So to be indirect, you, you flag her down, and there's a whole, again, layer of things. One, I call it, it's called universality. You know what, we all go through this. Let me tell you about my kids. <laughs> my goodness, I got stories for you, ma'am. <laughs> so universality, go through this. Insulation of hope, we come out the other side. It's worth it. Um, I just want, to, want you to know you're doing the right thing and I know it's hard but you're doing the right thing my goodness and, and the relational message indirectly is as this young pastor bends over backwards to make this work for her to make it work for her better solving the problem and building in things that's going to make next Sunday much better um, all the time I'm doing that the relational message would be he really wants me here he really really wants me here so not the gospel encouragement but Coming from that place would be the idea. So, true story, uh, my wife saw this woman the Sunday before, and she had this girl in her lap, and she took her finger and was tracing the cross on the hymnal, um, her little child's finger on the cross on the hymnal. And I think the child was probably hypnotized, something like that, but the whole service. And she told me this sweet story. And so, I grab her by the car, got to say these things, and I just say, just so you know, I told her that story. I've seen how you are with her. It's cool. You 
think I'm looking at a bad mom? <laughs> think again. Um, not that we're anybody's perfect, of course. Um, one time I had a talk to a seminary professor. No, I'm sorry. I had a speech on this, and a student was a daughter of a seminary professor. She's on the phone with him, and she has this thing in her head. She's supposed to come up with a story about biblical encouragement. So while she's talking to her dad, a seminary, seminary professor, talking about all of his burdens and he can't get this done and how he's going to get that done, and in a pause, she just says, you know what, Dad, I don't think I ever told you this, but I'm, I'm really proud of you. She said, I don't think I ever told you this, but I'm really proud of you. And she said, my dad is never speechless. He's never, ever speechless. And I'm just telling you, I bet he went back to his past that day different, different. I don't know when my kids say that to me. So that's an example. From the outside, nothing significant happened. From the outside, it was just a pretty simple, a pretty simple exchange from a daughter and a dad. Let's do one more. I think this is an example we kind of said before. It's not cliche that a child can internalize that things are their fault. It's not cliche. This is an example of there being lots of layers of fear. I uh, can't get my work done. I'm so, I just can't. Um, who else, to the biggest fear of who, who else is going to walk away at me or what else can I lose? Just this whole range of fears that you address not in one conversation but in a whole, throughout the course of the relationship. Sweetheart, just do your best. I know. It's going to be hard to concentrate. Just do your best. All the way to the giving the gospel in that particular shape of the, the one who will never leave you. He just will never leave you. Never, never. And it's going to be okay because Jesus is alive, you see. So just that's what that example is for. We could talk about it a lot. Let's get to two final points. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a gender stereotype that it could be maybe kind of counterintuitive to the men maybe, I don't know if that's true or not, but that if I'm just listening to you, I'm not really doing anything all that productive because I'm just listening to you. But if you think about it, how can empathic listening all by itself give the gift of true encouragement? Their dynamic would simply be, you say, if anybody saw me, if anybody saw me, they would surely look away, they would surely turn away and reject me. And empathic listening all by itself says, I see you and I'm not turning away. And best of all, it comes then after an hour of listening, that five minutes of Sunday school truth. You're loved, you're loved. Everlasting love. So that's what I like that one for. One more, one more point. We'll call it biblical delight. What is the effect when one Christian takes genuine godly pleasure at the expression of faith and love of another? And what are the biblical precedents? I test a lot of my thinking. I've got a colleague who taught me to say about Christian apologetics, how do the apostles talk? If I talk that way, then I'm, I'm doing, it, doing it fine, right? I apply the same test to the stuff I teach. I was writing a Thanksgiving sermon back in the day and I just got into my head, well, I think Paul does this a lot. Or early, early in the letter, he just pulled someplace in that first chapter or so, we'll have this whole thing about, oh, your faith, oh, your love, oh, your hope. What, what this does for me to see that. Even Corinth, you all know Corinth is kind of a mess, but even Corinth, both letters, there's that paragraph where it's, you've been given fullness in Christ. And so he will comment on the things only God could have ever done for them things only God could do, he's going to comment, that, comment on them and take something from them. So I'm, I'm reading through my New Testament, just flipping around, how many times does he do this? And I just, about, you know, fell off my chair because always, <laughs> always, this is how the apostles talk. This is how they talk. Always, except Galatians. Galatians is like, what, have you lost your minds? <laughs> because they've lost, they're losing the gospel and so we can't be in that mode with them. But it's just what he does. How about Jesus? Uh, any example there? there? There's times, you know, that Jesus just bursts out with, oh, this is faith. 
The, the widow put her last mite in the offering and he does not let that moment pass, but he gathers the disciples around and say, did you see what she did? He doesn't let it pass, but he comments on it. That was everything she had, he says. There's one time, if I have this right, I should have double checked. Jesus, full of joy in the Holy Spirit, tilts his head back and looks to the sky. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. This was not revealed by men. You've hidden these things from the wise and learned and given them to children. Thank you, Father. And there's this bursting delight of Jesus. Why? Because somebody knew, actually knew who he is. Somebody actually knew who he is. You're the Christ, the Son of God. And he takes real pleasure from that. So it's like for our teachers, I'd say a little child in the classroom, you know, did a brave thing or did a compassionate thing. And I'm going to say, you're just going to let that moment pass. Take the child aside and say, you know what? Just so you know, I heard what you did. A student came to me once. Um, Pastor Paulus, I just want you to know my grandpa died. Oh. Sorry to hear that. Were you close? And she says, yeah, he raised me. She told that story. How are you doing? And she says, well, to be honest, I'm jealous. Grandpa sees the face of Jesus. That's all I've ever wanted, she says. What do you say to that? I mean, you could tilt your head to the sky and say, thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. This was not revealed by men. <laughs> but what you want her to see is that I'm taking something from this. I said something like only a Christian would even think of it this way. Oh my goodness, only a Christian. And why would this be encouraging? It's because I look at myself and all I see is the struggle. And that's really all I see and it's just not a pretty thing to look at. That someone, my brother or sister, would see something else than just that. I think that's encouraging. Um, I know that's encouraging. Oh, your faith, oh, your love, oh, your hope, this thing only God could have given you, only God could have worked it, and it is a pleasure. It is a true pleasure to get to meet it and see it and experience it. That's encouraging. So uh, no matter what presentation I ever give, I kind of always end with the same quote somehow. It always takes me the same quote. And the quote is from, this is obnoxious, sorry, I'm just making sure I don't go over time. Um, the quote is from J.P. Kaler, and he says, the desired end is brought about by us being, quote, ever more deeply absorbed in the gospel, not letting go until it blesses. So ever more deeply absorbed in the gospel, not letting go until it blesses. Of course, it's a brilliant allusion uh, to Jacob resting with God. Let me go, not until you bless me. So I'm not letting go. Across a lifetime as a Christian, there are a lot of times when I just hold on to the gospel. I just hold on to it. There's no lightning striking. There's no feels. There's just, I'm just holding on to it. It isn't every day, it isn't every day that this is, it's this thing like I never heard it before. It's so, so fresh and so surprising. It isn't every day, now and then. But we just hold on. You know, we just hold on. Ever more deeply absorbed in the gospel, not letting go till it blesses. I want to put this on my tombstone because he didn't let go of something like that. He didn't let go and it blessed him, which is to say that moment arrived when the gospel opened up and reveal its final secrets, you know. So if anything today makes you sort of covet and desire and want the ability to design words in a certain way for the people around you to have this culture of grace that goes with you, um, what will we do? We will become ever more deeply absorbed in the gospel, not letting go until it blesses. This is the prerequisite. The prerequisite is a full heart. You kings, you priests, you children of God, it's a full heart. God bless you. Thank you. Oh, glory to him. Thank you for your time. Time for worship. Let's, let's give uh, Dr. Paul Shin. In my prayers tonight or and maybe tomorrow morning, um, thankfulness for the encouragement of the gospel. I'm thankful for such a gospel-centered servant um, who our future pastors and teachers and staff ministers um, sit at his feet 
And you think about students from our congregation, you think about Paul Wagner and Josh Fish and Elizabeth Oakland and their classmates who are thinking of saying to the Lord, here am I, send me, that they get to be filled with this day in and day out. Uh, may the encouragement given us this evening, um, then, then who in your orb, who in your little circle, who can you be such an encourager to uh, tomorrow, this week, to Jesus' glory? So we're going to start church in about four minutes. Uh, you're free to leave. And so um, thank you, Dr. Palschin. We'll start church in about four minutes. Thank you.